Thank you for making time to join us at this facilitated dialogue. We named it the Silent Pandemic Loneliness in the Church because I think it's a timely word for the church. Uh, at this time in history, having come out of over two years of uh, isolation due to the pandemic, and as we start outside services, I think we're all grappling with what it means to do church in a new way in these new times. So before we get started, I'm very privileged to uh, invite East School President, Reverend Dr. Chan Chuan Kyok, to just say a few words and to open us in prayer. Shall we welcome him? Welcome. It's my prayer that you will be greatly, greatly blessed this afternoon. The speakers this afternoon are practitioners. They are not people who stay in the ivory tower and write things, but have gone through it. And particularly, uh, Pastor Chuan. I heard him, in, and actually not only heard him, I saw through what he shared. It's a man who, who God has raised to really touch the community. Well, Dr. Swain, he spoke at my church, and you know we were flawed by it. Very practical, very personal, very vulnerable. And uh, so the church could not have enough of him, so he's coming back again. In our first seminar, which we talk about uh, uh, intergenerational issues, uh, Siuli did a fantastic job. You know, I just say, my goodness, God has really raised her for such a time as this. And uh, she is placed in a very good place, and her heart is also to reach out to the Christian community. And so you're part of that. Um, don't worry, today that you are here, we do not assume that you are lonely. But you are, you're in the right place. <laughs> and it's, I, so I my prayer that uh, this afternoon interaction will be greatly a blessing. And also eye-opener to ways how the church and church groups can minister to the people and be part of a community that loves and cares. And, you know, there are certain times that we are lonely. But we want to see how we can reach out to others as we go through trials ourselves. And this pandemic is such a silent thing that comes to. And we assume that, oh, it's over now, it's an endemic. But it triggers a continuing effect. And some of us have got on this uh, COVID virus. Oh, by the way, I joined the club about two weeks ago. I'll show you, I'm clean now. But this has been made possible because of the great initiation by Chin Ling. Chin Ling's associate uh, uh, trainer from Kapel. Would you wave to us? Yeah. He's the one that came and said, hey, we need to do something. Shall we do it together? And so that is the outcome. And it's my prayer that this is one session that will continue, second and not the last. So let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you have brought us together. You have a message for us. You have something for us to learn, something for us to unlearn, something for us to relearn as we reach out to people in our care, people who are lonely, and that we can be able to touch their lives as we hear wisdom from you shared this afternoon. So, Father, we praise you and thank you for your presence with us. You are great and awesome, God. We worship you. You are the true shepherd. You are the one who guides us. You are the one who holds us close to yourself. And we cannot thank you enough. And so we praise you. Minister to us deeply through your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Chan. Okay, let me invite my panel to be with on stage with me so that it's not so uh, lonely. <laughs> okay, can we invite um, Pastor Lawrence Chua? A senior pastor of Living Sanctuary Brethren Church, and Dr. Tan Suin, who is the director of Grace Works. Come, come take your seat. Now, as they settle down, I just want to share that in the course of preparing for this um, dialogue, I wasn't sure what topic to focus on, but loneliness kind of crept in as something that I felt was important because also because of a season of life that I'm going through. Just a brief introduction. I returned from the mission field after 14 years serving in Timor Leste last year. So I have gone through a lot of adjustment in the past 12 months and, um, I, and I will be making some references to my experiences as well. I want to start by asking my panelists to share with us first an anecdote or a story of loneliness in their own lives. 
Pastor Lawrence has come from a very, um, he, he came from a meeting of brethren pastors. He literally rushed here. So I really appreciate him <laughs> making time out of his busy, busy schedule. Yeah, yeah I, I meet with a, a group of senior pastors from the brethren churches, about nine of us. We meet every month for peer mentoring. We mentor one another by sharing all kinds of things. And uh, that question was posed to me uh, during a preparation time and was trying to wreck my brain uh, to think of uh, and, into, uh, and look into my own life, a situation of deep seasons of uh, uh, loneliness. And I can identify two. One, when I was very young, and then the other one is a continuing loneliness. Uh, when I was uh, born, shortly after that, my uh, mom and dad gave me away uh, to, for adoption. So it was, uh, I was given to a very close relative, my tope, uh, my, uh, my dad's elder brother. And, uh, and for the first nine years of my uh, life, my own parents took care of me because my adoptive mother was in China, couldn't come out. So my topic can't possibly bring up a little kid, you see. So it was like uh, the uh, Exodus story <laughs> where Moses was uh, being nursed by her own mother. So my parents nursed me until when I was nine, then my adoptive mother came from China. Uh, but all along, you know, I was teased uh, by my sibling, we got big family, mom, dad, and uh, 11 children, 13 in the family, big family, crowded. But I tell you, in that crowdedness, uh, sibling uh, one after another, very uh, play all the time, etc. There was a deep sense of loneliness. Basically, I, I thought I didn't belong. I was given away. And uh, I wasn't accepted, that's why they gave me away. And uh, so, so but I was too young, I was nine years old, so I, couldn't, I couldn't understand what is that loneliness, and also I couldn't handle it, so it was a very, very bad time experience. So that's, a, that's the one thing that stuck with me in my life about this, this what is it to be lonely, about being uh, not accepted, not wanted, uh, even though in a crowded home of 13 people. Then the other one is, uh, in my leadership uh, experience, uh, I, I started, uh, leading groups when I was very young. In my uh, secondary four days, I started leading, leading all kinds of groups. Uh, and I discovered in the early days of my leadership as a teen, I was leading about 20 other teens, uh, they would, uh, besides going out to work, evangelizing, they would have lots of social function. Teens, uh, young people, lots of function. I'm always left out. They would leave me out. I was the chairman or so. And it was quite hard for me, you know, because I felt that, how come nobody wants me? I'm their leader. Uh, then I planted the church. I led the church, uh, 74 till now, up to today. Then I think I handled it better because now I'm an adult, no more a kid. It's the same thing, you know, nobody wants to sit with me in front, nobody <laughs> invites me to, uh, nobody invites me out at a camp, you know, cell function, everybody got their own program, I'll be left all alone in the camp when hundreds of people all disperse, there's Lawrence Chua there, and it, it is, uh, then I discovered that there's such a thing called uh, a leader is a very lonely person, very, very lonely. So these are two uh, sort of experiences of uh, loneliness that, in a personal way that, that hit me. Um, I don't think people dislike is that uh, they, they can't fit me into their, their frame of things. They, they, maybe they think that I'm a, a spoiler, you know, a holy cow or something. But the whole idea is that very often you're alone. Not just social, but when you grapple with big church issues, Every morning you spend hours and hours, computer, Bible, all alone, prayer walk, everything is alone, alone and alone. So that is my experience of loneliness. Thank you. And we will circle back to talk about some of the things that Pastor Lawrence mentioned. How about Dr. Tan? I know you've had some pretty intense experiences with loneliness. I have to fight off a desire to go and hug Pastor Lawrence at this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, we can do afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Because I understand about the loneliness of leaders. And yeah. hearing his story actually also provoked a childhood memory. Uh, I was the uh, only child for a while. My younger sister came about nine years later. 
so alone. But then the first child my parents actually had was uh, a girl that they had adopted. Uh, again, those days they were adopted from a family and many children, their, uh, his sister's family. But she had died of dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, and because of that, my parents were very protective and wouldn't let me mix around very much or get involved in many things. So I always remember childhood as being alone. So when dad came back, that was cool. Uh, there was domestic helper, there was some interaction there. But I always feel going through life alone in those early days. And perhaps accentuated by the fact that my mother, I think when I was one or something, she came down, when I was two, she came down to, to Singapore to do some graduate studies. It was a big sacrifice on her part. By getting that extra certificate, she could go to a bigger job that provided money for the family. So it was a, sac a sacrifice on her part. But again, I felt alone with that, but mom wasn't there. So childhood memories of being alone. Uh, playing alone, they buy you toys, you play alone. Um, then another experience of loneliness, actually I'm an extrovert and maybe as a reaction to my childhood, I do not know, but I actually make friends easily. And normally I'm not alone. Lah. But then various key transitions in my life uh, made me alone. I just named one. One was the death of my first wife. When you become a widower, suddenly you find yourself in a club which is very select. Very few people are in that club and they don't know how to reach out to you. They care, but when they try to care, you know they don't understand. Lah. Because it's such a unique experience. There were one or two brothers who were also widowers and, and they, they really helped. But you felt, man, the world has fallen apart. Your, I had two young children, my wife had died, and uh, you just felt so lonely. So I think sometimes lonely comes because of certain uh, key transitions uh, that, that you have gone through. So these are two of my examples. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing so honestly. We are going to have a time of uh, facilitated small group discussions later and you will also get a chance to share some of your personal experiences of loneliness. And I think just to be authentic, I also want to share a short account of a recent ongoing <laughs> episode of loneliness. Having said that, you know, I, I relocated from Timor-Leste back to Singapore last year and I remember vividly the day that I moved into my apartment um, to stay on alone about a month after I had arrived in Singapore. Now, in my imagination, I would be very happy to finally move into my flat and, you know, be able to live in it. I had not lived in it at that point. It was a new flat. So in my mind, I was going to be very excited to take possession of my flat. But the day that I moved in, somehow it just hit me like a ton of bricks that I was totally alone. Mm -hmm. Having left a country that I lived in for 14 years, left my community behind, uh, now I'm in a new part of Singapore, living alone. I really felt like I lost my entire village, mm. <laughs> you know. And so that was an emotionally interesting episode because I didn't see it coming. I didn't expect to feel that way. So I want to spend the next few moments just providing up for us some definitions to, of loneliness that we can hang this dialogue on. Let me read to you this quote that I found in a journal article. Loneliness is defined as a distressing feeling that accompanies the perception that one's social needs are not being met by the quantity or especially the quality of one's social relationships. So the key here is quality. You may have enough relationships in a quantitative way, but somehow you feel as though the quality of these relationships are not adequate to meet your needs for connection. I like the second quote as well. Loneliness is a subjective feeling where the connections we need are greater than the connections we have. In the gap, we experience loneliness. So I think this also sums it up very nicely that you, you experience a gap, what you need and what you're getting. And that is a subjective perception. And that is what we would normally call a state of loneliness. And there are different tools to measure loneliness. This is a commonly used tool called the UCLA Loneliness Scale. It has 20 items and you rate this depending on how often you feel this way from I often feel this way to I never feel this way. So there are 20 statements. I've just given you a few as an example. So for example, I'm unhappy doing so many things alone. So how often do you feel this way? You rate yourself. I have nobody to talk to. I cannot tolerate being so alone. I like companionship and so on and so forth. Now, this resource is on a Padlet page that I will tell you about later. So you will get uh, access to it and you can use it maybe even in your small group or in your ministry to uh, rate 
you know, yourself in the context of a small group and then maybe you can open up conversations. Now on this note, I want to come back to the panel. How should we understand the issue of loneliness in our churches? Because we don't want to overestimate it, but we also don't want to underplay it. So what, what is your take on how we can correctly frame the issue of loneliness in church? Uh, well, I think um, loneliness actually is a feeling. Uh, it's something very uh, emotional. And uh, it is a, a feeling of being alone and with no one else in close relational proximity. Now, this can happen. Uh, that means a lonely person uh, can be in a crowd and yet feel very lonely. Uh, he may be in a group of many acquaintances and find no one in close relational proximity. You can have people in uh, geographic proximity that's just next to you in an MRT train, shoulder to shoulder, or in a church, thousands of people. But relationally, the proximity is very, very distant. And that's, that's how I feel. And uh, the church should try to... Uh, get people to bridge this relational proximity and um, maybe help people to lay some foundation uh, to, to build deeper or more satisfying relationship. And this would contrast to the distant and the superficial relationship. So we must do something, not, uh, to, not to have a distant and superficial, but get people into closer uh, relational uh, relationship. And the, the church should try to uh, structure in such a way that can, can facilitate it. And I think that maybe later on we might chat uh, more about it. I care very much about people feeling at home when they come to my church. Maybe because my background, you know, mm -hmm. I, since uh, I, I didn't quite enjoy being lonely and mm -hmm. I'm always on the lookout um, of people that uh, appear to be all alone with no one helping. And I'm the senior pastor. I, after service, I will be walking about. And uh, although socially I'm very awkward, that means if you throw me in a party, uh, in a cocktail party, 10th banquet, I'll be stuck somewhere in the corner with orange, uh, glass of orange, and don't know what to do, whether I should call it left hand, then right hand, then left hand, then right hand. Uh, very awkward. Uh, so that's me, very introvert, very private. Uh, but in church, I'm in my elements because uh, I'm, SP, I'm functional. I, I must function as a people connector. So I have got no problem whatsoever. So my, my members cannot believe that I mm. am socially awkward. Mm. They say it cannot be. You know, my SP is the friendliest person on earth, but I'm operating functionally. Mm. And I just, I just go out and I, I introduce myself, ask them for their name, and I try to connect people. My ambition is, my desire is to see everybody in church getting connected and not come to church alone, standing somewhere, <laughs> and or just the family. I think this is, this is not church. I think it is so sad. Um, I, I, I preached uh, at the recent camp. I think that's how Sully caught uh, a statement from me. I, I told the whole church, I said, we are church, it's supposed to be very warm, etc. But there are, there are lonely people in our church that don't belong. And uh, this, this is, cannot be, cannot happen in the church. Say, so church, we cannot let this happen, right? Uh, so this is uh, how my, my personal passion, and I feel that it should start with me. Uh, I hope that my whole church should gather around me because it takes a whole ecosystem, whether a church is warm, is open, is accepting or not, it, it takes everybody uh, to do it. Okay, let me zoom out a little bit. The UK actually appointed its uh, first, the world's first loneliness minister, and this was in 2018, before the pandemic. So there is actually such an office in the United Kingdom. And then shortly after in, uh, I can't really see very clearly. Okay, in 2021, in, you know, at the peak of the pandemic, Japan also appointed a minister of loneliness to tackle this issue. And there's a lot of research into the health impact of loneliness. Uh, and these are just some, some news articles that I found. I want to talk a little bit about what Pastor Lawrence mentioned just now, which is the loneliness of leadership. I think it is a, a very peculiar feature. 
And I think it's something that many of you here can relate to. Many of you are leaders in, in some capacity. And when I talked to both gentlemen about this, they had a very different response. So Pastor Lawrence was very matter of fact about the loneliness that a leader has to go through. Do you want to say a little bit more? Uh, I, I thought that it is all part of leadership. It, it, it's loneliness and you must learn to accept it. Uh, don't make a hue and cry of it. And if you cannot stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Right? But if you're a chef in the kitchen, you just take the heat. And if you're a leader in church, uh, you just got to take the loneliness. And I've learned to just accept it. I laugh about it, sitting all alone and nobody cares about me. And uh, I think I cope much better, uh, much more because of, of my age. Lah, huh? I think I cope much better. And um, yeah, compared to when I was young, that was more difficult. So I, I take it as a matter of fact. Mm. But Dr. Tan, you had quite a, a strong reaction when I talked about the loneliness of leadership. Yeah. Well, I think the question of loneliness of leadership cannot be divorced from the whole question of loneliness. And I think when we say that loneliness is just a feeling, it might give the impression that it's not that serious. But I'd like to go back to theology, to Genesis 2.18, it's not good for man to be alone. That we are created to be relational beings. It, it, it's not just a, a, a sociological feeling thing. It's a statement of what it means to be human. That just as uh, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, relational, then we are made in this image. We are also meant to live uh, in relationship with others. So the first human beings was a mini community, Adam and Eve. So I think the breakdown of uh, relationships uh, is not just an emotional inconvenience. I think it has real world implications. Uh, one study has shown that if you have no social connectedness, it affects your mortality as though you smoke 15 cigarettes a day. How many, how many bodies here smoke 15? Okay, they're not saying, uh, but anyway, uh, it is equivalent. And you, you smoke, oh, oh pastor. Oh, 14. 14 only, okay, can. Maybe I can. So, if you smoke 15 cigarettes a day, it's equivalent to, to uh, that, that, that's how it affects your mortality. In fact, it's worse than even uh, lack of exercise and improper diet. It's even more dangerous. But I think our church, talking about church in Singapore or in any big town, I think we seem to be focused on rationalism and intellectualism, knowing the right doctrines, or activism, let's save the world. So no right knowledge, save the world. But we talk about relationships, but in de facto, it doesn't really happen in our churches. It's mentioned, but it's... To me, it doesn't really happen, and from what I see. People are more concerned getting the right doctrines and saving as many people or recovering society or fighting for a cause. These are the things that are very important, and we will sacrificially attend to that. But you know you need time for relationships. Huh? It, it, it just doesn't happen. You have to invest time for relationships. And by de facto, maybe it's a Singapore culture. Uh, productivity is our religion. Um, that has crept into the church, uh, getting things done, uh, be efficient, uh, knowing the right doctrines, uh, these are the important things. So I think relationships are lost um, by default. And so talk about loneliness in church, we come to church, the main thing is to go through the program and get things done. Then you go home again lonely. So not everybody as tough as him. Uh, so, uh, so there is a real concern for me, because when we are not connected to others in any real connections, we, we, it, it affects our flourishing, not just as Christians, as human beings. We are not flourishing because we are walking through life alone, and this is not right to me. I think the revolution of going away from loneliness must first be theological, that we are really convicted that we should be walking together with other people. It's not just a reaction to some uh, sociological thing and really providing the kind of platforms, whether it's cell groups, uh, small groups, or whatever that, there must be a platform where people can really know and be known. Uh, a friendship is a one where I have time to know your, your backstory and you know my backstory, your joys, your pains. Even listening to Pastor right now, I get a snapshot of how tough his life was. But that's what makes us friends. I know about him. Uh, he knows a bit about me. And, and as you continue this journey, as we swap stories, we will get to know each other better. But this hardly happens in church. So much of communication in church is highly transactional. If you talk to people and you even get things, hey, next week you can lead Bible study or not? <laughs> then when a leader talks to you who never talked to you, when you get suspicious, you know? Uh, how are you, huh? Why? Why? No, la, I just concerned. You want me to teach Sunday school, is it? No, la. 
Okay, la, can you teach Sunday school or not? Well, yeah, they, they don't really care for you. So they say that the church is friendly, but they are not really friends. The church is friendly. They, they will help you, but they are not really investing time in connectedness. I think this is a major struggle with the church today. And there are many in church who are as lonely as the world outside, if not worse. Now, going back to the question about leadership, I agree that by de facto, by being a leader, there are certain things you cannot share with others. And people will perceive you in a certain way. Not that you want to be but people see you in that way and they keep you at a distance. This is part of the price of leadership. We sh we, they didn't show us the small print, we didn't realise it when we, be when we become leader. Well, as a leader, I go back to my own church, some of my friends begin to shy away. So last time when you were a friend, you, you mingle with us, now you go and mix with other people. So I passed on my BOPM, I had to mix with them. I said, no, no, you're not a good friend anymore. Oh, I had to go and do damage control with all my old friends. But that's because I became a pastor now, leader now. So they view you differently. I can only say that leaders, therefore, must form friendship support groups of fellow leaders. Probably from other church, maybe. Two or three where we sit down and we are not reverend this or pastor that, we are just brothers and, and then share our tears and our joys. I think we desperately need this and I feel very, very moved when I hear your story, Pastor. I, I think it shouldn't be. I know you can tahan, but it shouldn't be. And, 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 and we should help leaders find the kind of connectedness they need to find the, the support they need to survive in the long haul. Whenever I hear of famous leaders fall into sin or that, I always ask myself, they are probably tired and lonely. They are probably tired and lonely. And they have no support of friends who treat them as equals and able to hear their story and able to encourage them as a friend. That's my suspicion. Once in a while, wow, this famous saint fall down. I suspect you go beyond the surface, they're all lonely and tired. I know many leaders in Singapore are, especially the most successful ones, are lonely and tired. And no, I don't think that's God's will, eh? and you will lead to all sorts of dysfunctions. Yeah, I appreciate this conversation because I think there's something we can all take away, which is to see our leaders in a new light. I think when I was chatting with uh, Dr. Tan privately, and he said, do we see our leaders as service providers? You know? That we go to them because we need a service from them. And even during our recent church camp, just a few months ago, I was uh, talking to one of the elders on day two. And he was saying that when it was dinner time and everybody went out mm. in their cell groups, Pastor Lawrence was all alone. Mm. And he, him and his wife are always alone at every church camp. I think you end up eating with Elder Chris, right? Yeah, so Elder Chris was telling me that story. And, you know, in that moment hearing it, it really broke my heart that yes. Pastor Lawrence has no one to have dinner with at a church camp. And I think we often forget our leaders in such settings and such contexts. And this is something that we can all begin to do differently, to look out for them at these events. When it's time to pray together, if your SP is standing alone, maybe go up to this, go up and pray, pray with them. Yeah. yeah. So I think there is a certain peculiar peculiarity of feeling lonely as a leader. Mm. And for me, uh, just to share a very interesting anecdote is thanks to Pastor Lawrence giving me the opportunity, I've preached at church twice and it's a very interesting experience to have people know about your life mm -hmm. because they've heard it in a sermon, but they don't know you, mm -hmm. right? People know things about my life and my past because I have to make some sermon illustrations, but they don't know me. Mm -hmm. Then they see me in service and they shoot looks at me. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't know what they're thinking. And maybe they think they know me, but they don't know who I am. And I think many of the preachers here would... would have that experience all the time, that people know about you as a public figure, but they're not your friend. There's no personal relationship, and it's quite a surreal feeling. Mm. Yeah, so I think we can all be kinder to the people who, who lead and serve us uh, week after week. Now, I want to now zoom in on some demographics that perhaps are more vulnerable to this issue of loneliness. Um, let me maybe just present I think one very clear group is the elderly in our midst. Mm. Now this graph uh, shows the percentage or proportion of residents who are aged 65 and over from the years 2000 to 2030. So what you really need to take note of is the fact that by the year 2030, which is not too far from now, 187 mm. almost 20% of residents will be aged 65 and over. And that works out to 900,000 people, age 65 and over, the elderly in our midst. And I think, Pastor Lawrence, you have talked about this group and how they, it, you're really concerned for, for the elderly in our churches. Yeah, um, 
Uh, number one, I, I discovered that uh, these people, they, they, they've retired, so the main uh, daily activity, the, uh, the work where they find meaning, income from, has uh, mm. ceased. So uh, after the, one, the first one or two years of retirement, all the euphoria, you go on Royal Caribbean, then you go for you know, uh, celebrity, and whatever it is, comes to an end. Uh, what is left is just daily quarrel with their wife, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got uh, a lot of cases where the wife would just want to kick the husband out and says, "Please go back to work." Uh, so uh, I, I find that they get into very typical from you know, whole long list, whole books, but basically they are they are lonely, uh, they are bored. They wake up and you know how many hours can you spend on stretch times, etc. And then they they lack the significance. Mm. You know? Uh, and I have a heart for them, um, and I find that people are retiring just too early. They, they, and they retire because they, f they feel very tired. Say, I worked 40 years, I've worked 45 years, I deserve it. I want to get, I want to retire, I must leave. Um, then they get into this period where they get into loneliness, uh, boredom, and lack of significance. Uh, and then they deteriorate very, very quickly, mm. and that's my concern. And as a church, uh, I, I, I feel that uh, human beings are God's resources. Yeah. They want us to live to fulfill a mandate, and all of us are very, very s a simple but very uh, powerful mandate, and that's to win the loss of Christ. And uh, we cannot have these people in our church that are just bored, <laughs> lonely, staying at home. And I would love to mobilize them. Um, most of them are still in reasonably good health. Uh, our healthcare is so good, they can reasonably expect to live up to 80, 85, so they have 25 years. How are they going to cope with loneliness, boredom, lack of significance? You know, that, that uh, beats me. Nah. And I, I want to challenge my church uh, to, I want to mobilize. I, I keep telling my elders, and uh, I'm going to preach a key message very soon, that in, in living century, we have to get this group of people, uh, mobilize them uh, into kingdom business. Uh, I'm not asking them from uh, five-day week outside in the secular world, come to do five-day week in the church, not necessary. It's from five-day week to two-day week, three-day week, but it is a change of uh, investment focus. And they must start investing uh, in the kingdom. And uh, I want to set an example because I'm I'm 73, you know, so I'm going to 74. Uh, I, I practice law, I lead the, law, uh, I lead the church, uh, and I say that if I can do it, uh, then the rest can do it. I uh, have a, a meaningful, uh, live life to the fullest, and yeah, and I, I think that would give the significance to a lot of people uh, in the church. And Dr. Tan, when we were talking about this, you highlighted another demographic that we don't usually associate mm. with loneliness. Tell us more about this group of people. Well, I, like, I want to talk about Gen Z, but can I just add on a bit to this concern? But the fact of the matter is because of better health care and better diet, many of us will live much longer. And so this is no longer a small ministry in church. This is a major ministry in church. Uh, what are we going to do? Because... Um, Seniors are lonely for various reasons. One is some of their friends have passed away. Some, their health make, means that they can't go out and visit because they cannot travel, that they're not that mobile as they used to be. Some are not that familiar with social media. So just Zoom. Lah. So zoom is what, what is Zoom? So you can't assume. Those of us who are younger adapt technology easier. We're not that lonely, but some of them may not know how to do this. In fact, that makes them even feel stupid, which they shouldn't. Then uh, we, we talk about their own struggles with significance. Really, now I see the world is dominated by those who are very tech-savvy. Then they feel they're so boyong, no use, I have no longer any use. They struggle with feelings of, of inadequacy, of no value. Uh, struggles with fear of mortality. Now death is quite near now. Last time it can be a nice theological discussion, now it's reality. Especially now I went to my friend's funeral. So how do I grapple now with the reality of death coming up? Of course, all of us should be struggling with this. Like, huh? But the, old, the older, this is very, very obviously down the line. I also want to say that some even struggle with whether enough money to survive the rest of my years or not. 
some can go Royal Caribbean, some actually are worried whether they can have enough money to survive, especially if the, there's no caring family. This is a very real fear of some of them, not enough money to finish my years on earth. Although I see our government is as good as any in the world, better to care for people. Then I also think that seniors age differently. So there's my mother who had, the last 10, 20 years was in dementia. She can't contribute anymore. She needs help. Are we willing to invest these things as our church to help those who can't contribute but who need help? Those with dementia. My mother passed away last year. The last 10 years, I can't really communicate with her properly. So sad. You lose them before you lose them. And so there are people who need help, not just contribute. On the other hand, my principal from Regent College, Dr. Houston at 99, is still writing devotion. House of Kauwe, 99, is still writing devotion. So my point being that seniors age differently. And so there's no one size fit all ministry for seniors. We need to discern. Some will need a lot of care. They can't give anything. They can need a lot of care. Some actually can be mobilized for kingdom work until the last day they go home to the Lord. So we help each one to do what they can do and help them receive help that they need. So this is a big, big issue. I'm sure East has got key thinkers working on this. <laughs> because this is a huge thing. You cannot run away from this, as the numbers have shown. So one key area are seniors. I think we really need to take this seriously. And for both of this us, of course he's older than me. But for both of us, this is a very real and personal thing for us and our loved ones. The other group that, because we are doing the Generations Project, you know, Graceworks is doing actual on the ground research with people of all generations. So one generation complaining of loneliness are seniors, which we understand why. But the other generation was Gen Z or iGen or whatever, the youngest one, to, uh, don't count the alpha or whatever, I mean the youngest one. And uh, I was very confused at first. I said, why are these people complaining about loneliness? I mean, they got I mean, how many thousand friends on Insta? Or I, mean, what? I don't say Facebook because only old people are on Facebook. <laughs> Young people are on Insta, TikTok. So why, 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 why are they lonely? Uh, it's very confusing. And it's quite serious. All my friends who are in campus ministry, Campus Crusade, IFES, whatever, they said the number one struggles are many of the undergraduates is emotional and mental struggles. And that leads to depression. There's a real link between loneliness and depression. And of course, some suicides as well. So why young people lonely? Hello? Uh, so old people will say, in my time, uh, got no time to be lonely. Uh. If we walk 60 miles to go to school, uh, in the snow or uh, whatever. So, but why young people lonely? So maybe, and I'm open to be corrected, that connecting Virtually and connecting face to face is not the same. I can only assume that. I'm still waiting for more research. So I'm meeting a lot of friends online. When most of the young, their life is like that, huh? Their life is like that, not computer like that. Yeah. And but then thousands of friends online. Maybe deep down they feel that that is not the same as having a friend you can cry with or hug or be in the same room at the same time. But because they are on this all the time, they actually don't have time to go and do the other stuff. And they get so quite uncomfortable doing the other stuff because this is what they are used to now. So, how do we help our young? These are our children and grandchildren. They are not somebody out there. How do we help them find relationships? Can we, who are older, actually build authentic relationships? One study has shown that the young are less likely to lose, leave the faith if there are four or five older adults in the church who really know them personally and love them. All this takes time, right? 10,000 people in a program, much easier. To invest time to know individual, old or young, takes a lot of time there. Friendship means a lot of time there. But are we willing to pay the price so that our young can really know God love them because there are four or five adults who really love them and they don't feel so lonely and they know that God loves them also. So, my dear friends, there's a lot of work to be done. Old, young, we have to ask the Lord for wisdom because we are not that clever. God shows us what to do. The days ahead in terms of loneliness and connected to the faith uh, for our seniors and for our young and for every generation. Uh, we really need to take this pandemic seriously. Yeah, Dr. Tan, I um, re recall that when we were talking and preparing for this event, you had said that you made this statement, church is subconsciously for a certain demographic. Do you want to tell us more? Why, why did you say that? Why am I getting hated? Never mind. Uh, this is what we are here for. It's all right. Thank you. All right. No, it no, comes no. with the job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Shields up. But this is a very general statement, but the way the church is structured, by and large, it seems to be, and please, you can throw stones at me, it's meant for 
middle, upper middle class Chinese who are English speaking. So you don't fall within those demographics, kind of hard to fit in other races. Um, of course, Chinese speaking too have their own uh, community, but somehow it seems that what counts are the English speaking middle class. No, more need that, it, appear, it appears that Christianity is for those who are married and have children. So I go to some church I won't mention, there's always, oh, there's a parenting workshop coming up. There's a marriage prep workshop coming up. Then I said, how about thriving single? Who is your boy? Why got no seminar for thriving singles? Why always parent, parenting, marriage? What a whole bunch of people who are single and may, not want, may want to be married but not there. It means they're somehow uh, not complete, man. What, what, I thought that we are complete in Christ, not complete in marriage. No, and uh, what about widows, widowers? What about divorced people? Can we dare to say? What about those who struggle with SSA but may not want to be like that? They, they're looking for acceptance and love. So who really is the church for? Or those who struggle with mental illness, if one in seven in Singapore has some kind of mental illness, we say the good news is for all people. But I think the good news is only for some people, eh? within those demographics. So you've got some degree of, of de dementia or schizophrenia, but we don't know where to put you in. Lah. So we let the institution take care of you, but not the church. So the church is good news for all or only good news for a certain type of people, whether it's racial, economic background, uh, in terms of your marriage or singleness or having children. I always, it's really very tough for certain people during Mother Day, Father Day, well, very tough. As a pastor, I'm always very sensitive. I said, God gives us different experiences and all are valid. I don't want to just talk only about fathers. And those are, I want to be a father but cannot, how? Or my child has died, how? So, brothers and sisters, let's open our heart a bit more, lah. open our eyes a bit more and really make the church inclusive for all people so that nobody is unnecessarily left lonely. Lah. We, let's, we can do better. Lah. Let's, let, let's do better. Lah. Yeah, thank you. On that note, I also want to present you with another statistic. And this one, there's a lot going on, but what you really just need to point... Um, notice is that the orange bar is the proportion of singles amongst our resident population in 2020. Right? The blue bar is the proportion of singles in 2010. You have the males on the left and the females on the right. In the middle is the age column. So what you really need to take note of is the fact that the orange bar is longer in every column, in every row. Right? So what it means is that across every age bracket, proportion of singles has increased from 2010 to 2020 for both men and women, right? So that coupled with the aging um, crisis in Singapore means that we are going to have a lot of aged singles, yeah. right? The writing's on the wall and yeah. we should not be caught by surprise. Yeah. And I think as a church, we need to take note of the environment that we operate in. Mm. And certainly I think Dr. Tan has also pointed out other vulnerable groups that sometimes we don't think about so consciously. Um, so, in terms of demographics of concern, in the few months that I've been working at Capel Consulting, I've learned a lot of content for myself as well. Because I, I mixed around with you know, trainers and consultants, and one of the things that we've been, I've been exposed to is this thing called design thinking. It is a method that is user-centered, so it thinks about the people you are serving. And one step is something that we call persona mapping. That means you think about the groups of people you are serving, and you think about who they might be and you map out personas based on your observations of, of these people. So for example, if I attempted a personal mapping of people who might be feeling lonely in church, you might have a widow who says, I live alone. I have no one to talk to throughout the week. Yeah. You might have a young adult who says, I won't go to services if I cannot find a friend to sit with. This yeah. is actually what my friend has told yeah. me before. Yeah. Yeah. If I cannot find a friend to sit with, I don't go to service. Yeah. You might have a mother of three who says, I have no time to talk to anybody at church because I'm so busy keeping track of my children, mm. right? Dropping them off, picking them up. Mm. You might have Ravi, a professional who says, I dash in and out of services. I don't stop to talk to anybody. Mm. And a single who says what Dr. Tan has said, church activities are mostly for couples and families. Mm. So this, this step in design thinking, sometimes it helps me to take a step back to think about the people in our congregation rather than we take the perspective of our programs are like that or our models are like that, so you've got to fit us. Mm -hmm. But actually, these people may not be as visible as a large, happy family with three or four children, but actually, numerically, they could be a, make up a lot, you know, a high proportion of our congregation. 
Now, we're going to transit to the next part of our program, and we're really, uh, we need to make time here. So, church as a community of faith. So, Pastor Lawrence, what is your vision of how church should be? As a senior pastor who has led a congregation from a small congregation to what it is today. Yeah, I think when we started uh, with just 25 members, it was very, very easy, uh, very close in relationship, uh, seven days a week. Uh, that, but now we are into what? Pre-COVID, we were in the 1,800. Now, maybe f uh, about 1,500 is a lot more difficult. And one has got to be very intentional. The thing about a community in church is that it's never static. Mm. We don't declare a start date. That my church living sanctuary mm. is admitting members 1st January. Mm. You apply and it closes. 15 January, don't ever come again, all right? Because then this is my group I work with. People come in, people go out, the young, the old, and it is, uh, you know, it's a very fluid uh, community. So that makes it a, a, a lot harder. And uh, newcomers can come uh, anytime. Uh, and, and some stay long and some don't stay too long. So uh, managing a community of faith and trying to get everybody integrated uh, into the community is very, very challenging. So the, the, the best is just to make sure that there is a process. Uh, I feel that our church has a process of um, uh, welcoming people uh, making sure that the whole atmosphere of the church is very warm and, and then after welcoming the person is to try very hard to integrate that person so that uh, she can belong to a small group and uh, you know, get to know more people uh, and uh, several ways of getting them involved whether it's a small group or encourage them to, to serve we always feel that if you serve in any ministry the whole ministry itself becomes an oil course, uh, some family and the, the trick actually is to get people to go into smaller group where there's a greater uh, opportunity la, to establish a relationship. La. That's what we hope to do. Uh, of course, in the larger context, uh, a church, can, you can design a church whereby uh, you come and there's fantastic worship. You, know, you enter, all the lights go off, you know, the group light comes on, fantastic worship team and it's like concert, you get so charged up, and then once it goes, everybody goes back. And so it is, uh, it's not organized for, it, mm. for relationships mm. to even get started. In. Mm. Uh, so we want to get out of that and make sure that that experience is only part of it, but there's another very important part, for example, to facilitate um, interaction. So in our church, we hope to give you a very good worship experience, but after worship, we have what we call a melting pot. Uh, we have a huge kitchen. We serve a lot of food. And uh, we have a big uh, eating area. And uh, hundreds mm. of people will mm. just stay back and eat and talk. And we think that that is important. And because it creates opportunity for relationship to mm. form. Uh, and then you, you organize self etc. But that's quite standard. Uh, but the philosophy behind uh, whether you are doing ministry and encouraging um, people to, to network uh, is an important value system. Uh, so, for example, on Sunday, uh, my kitchen department, melting pot person, uh, I've got some, some issue with the leadership. And this new guy comes in and he told me, he said, Pastor, I'm prepared now to come on staff and take care of the whole melting pot. We call it melting pot. Uh, there are 40, 50 people in the whole ministry, the cook, the server, you know, the, all, the, all kinds of people in this department. And uh, I said, okay, uh, we, we should, uh, you must agree, number one, that if you run this thing, don't take it and run away with it, you know, but you must make sure that this ministry is very important, it must be fully integrated in the church. Do you agree? He said, yes, you agree. I said, number two, the people that you work with are not just to cook, serve food, but they are members of a flock, and you mm. must consciously help everyone to integrate with one another because that is what church is all about. We want to help people to form relationship mm. and not just to make you cook food and to serve on Sunday. Do you see it? Do you agree? So mm. at the back of my mind, everything must boil it down to getting people to find, to form, uh, and to grow in relationship. You know? Because it... it when you are in relationship with people, you, you need people 
to co-create joy. I mean, you cannot be happy alone. I mean, not easy. Lah, huh? Some of us can uh, listen to music and then go to the balcony. <laughs> and all our neighbors start calling, uh, I'm H, you know. <laughs> but uh, we could, when we go eat together, you need two person to talk, etc. And there's a co-creation. Uh, and we need relationship that is uh, encouraging, that is uh, affirming. But you, you don't encourage yourself and affirm yourself very much, right? I mean, I don't look at the mirror every morning and say, Lawrence, he will affirm you that you're such a handsome man. You know? uh, but to have friends that uh, when you're in a relationship, that's where this thing takes place. This, I'm encouraging, I'm affirming. You are encouraging, you are affirming. And this is what makes, uh, help people to find that significance and meaning. Uh. So that's why you need people to encourage you, to affirm you. You need people to co-create with you uh, joy. And these are the things that make for a very healthy uh, uh, inner person. And I think that the church is the best place uh, to, to find this relationship. Uh, um, that we, we form relationship in primary school. We form relationship in secondary school. Polytechnic, then university, and then the men go to NS, uh, then go to work. And you have all these relationships. I, I look at them all. I observe people having this relationship. Now, the type of relationship uh, that is most enduring would be church relationship. Now, I'm not saying that all church relationships will endure, but it will go by category. Generally, church relationships give you the best chance. Now, how do you measure the, the enduring quality of this relationship is to see who attends your funeral. Yeah. It's a bit late, right? I mean. Yeah. But you see, at your funeral, you must check, lah, but I've got to get your family to check. <laughs> Thank you. My primary school guys came, or my secondary school guy came, my golf khaki came. Who came to my funeral? I'll tell you. Your church friends, most of the time. A lot of us invest in relationship in those areas and think very little about giving the church community a chance where to build relationship. I tell people, you must build relationship. I think all of us got time uh, to invest, we got freedom, we got right, uh, we can run about overseas, uh, we can run about doing this, doing that. And I have a very good friend, a New Zealander missionary, and he has such a, a ministry all over the world, always spending time outside his New Zealander home. He's a good friend. And then one day he told me, he said, Lawrence, uh, my family in New Zealand, they, they, they called me up and they, they sat me down, whole family had a meeting, and scolded me and said, Dad, when you die, will the Taiwanese, will the Singaporean will attend your funeral or be people in New Zealand? <laughs> yeah. And then I shook him up. And then I suddenly remember that, the, that there are certain relationships that if you miss it out uh, because you were uh, placing emphasis on other relationship, you are not building up that enduring relationship. There are people that are just come and go, come and go. At the end of the day, there'll be this the, the emptiness. Yeah. So I, I would like to have a community of faith where, where people can build this out enduring relationship. I think Pastor is right that the early church was 30, 40 people meeting in the home. So all those commands about one another and the 26 one another commands in the New Testament can easily be carried out. The 30 people, 40 people, the meeting every week, maybe even more than that. But now, most of churches are much bigger than that. And uh, having a welcoming church, I think people can sense whether you really care for them or it's just doing this because out of duty. You have been to different churches before. When people say hello to you, you can sense that they really want to get to know you. Some, hey, how, how are you? Huh? And you really know. So it really has to be a transformation of the heart, la, that people really want to be representatives of Jesus as we encounter people. And that one cannot fake one. La. It's not a program. La. You really care for people. But talking about the different platforms, la, really the most sexy program for most churches is the Sunday morning worship. We put in all our effort, top musicians, top PA, everything. Sunday must go well. But this is excellent for inspiration, impartation, instruction, but it's lousy for relationships. Sunday morning, the big group meeting. Uh, it's not meant for relationships. Uh, it's not meant for that. And I think COVID has been a real discipline for us. If you don't have that, you have anything else or not. You don't have a sexy morning big worship with the top speakers, top musicians. You don't have that uh, for, 
for two years. Uh, then what else is the church offering? Is Christ reduced only to a sexy Sunday worship? So I think even if we want to move to a church that has more room for community, we need to talk about the platforms. Uh, where will they meet? So I think there are three levels of commi commitment that we see. One is I call the social group. Social group is makan together, eat together. Where we see Jesus eating people all the time. Uh. You know that you follow a saviour, people call glutton, uh, you know. Uh. So Jesus is eating all the time because he knows that sharing a meal is the most human activity. So the makan you have, the, the, the what, melting pot, is excellent because here, your you PhD, no D, what everybody needs to eat. Leh. So it, it's a celebration of a common humanity. We sit down to eat, we slow down, we begin to share a story. Hey, where you're from? Huh? Bum, bum, bum. So we begin to build. People cannot go from complete stranger to very deep relationship. The social grouping, sharing a meal, is a good entry into the beginning of friendship. It slows people down, it affirms our common humanity, and we can swap stories over the table. Second level is most of our church will be the cell group, lah, the small group which we now have you know, since Lawrence Kong. But people don't have a cell group now. And it is a small group, and that should be the place for ongoing friendship. Male, men, women, ongoing friendship. But of course, it depends on how you run your cell group. Some cell groups actually are small Bible studies, no relating one. I go to Bible study, I go back, nobody knows how, why I'm suffering, I don't know where they are suffering. So how do we make our cell groups more balanced so there's a place for the word, but there's a place to share our stories of joy and pain since the last time we met. It's the sharing of stories that knit us together. So you have to create space in our small groups. Because oh, we're here for the word. You say, yeah, sure, but then how about the word inside our life? No, I think we have two curriculum. One is the word, and one is the word that is experienced to, uh, in what we go through, the joys and pains we go through. That is part of our learning too. Man. Then the third is what I call the micro groups, the three or four which I put together in my three to one book. There are two or three very close friends that you really covenant to meet together. A, a three or two one or four to one where you really have very strong commitment to meet and be totally transparent. So we, you cannot force people into relationship. But if you ask what kind of platforms, social, makan, I think that's the easiest entry. Hopefully they are ready, next stage they join one of our small groups, but the small group themselves must be relational. It's not just activity. activity. And then finally we encourage and teach people how to do some small micro groups of three or four, uh, where we can meet and really go in depth with each other. So we need to be convicted first that this is life-giving, that community is as important as, as, as water and food, is crucial. Then we have to sh show the Holy Spirit move in us that we really care for people. Then thirdly, we must give some concrete platforms how that happens. Makan together. If that's all you can handle, then that's all you can handle. Lah. We makan together. Or you're ready for cell group. Then, or you're ready for to form two or three close friend group. So conviction, the power of the Spirit, but also the platforms that can help people in the morning. We cannot go back to early church, lah, but how can you do this today in realistic ways? And I think we need to have this kind of discussions. Yeah, so I have shared here a simple model that um, helps us to think through the levels at which we, we want to effect change. So intra is inner work within me. So even when we were, we were talking about this, Pastor Lawrence even said, it starts with smiling when you go to church. <laughs> change your countenance, look, look happy, <laughs> look friendly. Right? So that's intra work. And then interpersonal, how can we change the way we relate to one another? Pausing to say hi, making time. Uh, maybe going to church earlier so that you're not in a constant rush, right? Slowing down to talk to somebody. And then at the group level, th that's where Dr. Tan talked about changing the way we do small groups, making them more relational, less activists, so to speak. And then, of course, at the organizational level, like the example of having a ministry that serves food, mm. uh, a ministry of integrating newcomers. So I find this useful to, as, as a way of thinking through the levels at which we can effect change so that we, as it were, spread our eggs out in different baskets, you know, so that we have a better chance at um, making a change. So I just wanted to share that here because it might help some of us. I think as we talk, it is also evident that emotional intelligence has a big part to play in reaching out to one another, even being aware of people's needs. So this is a framework that Capel has developed uh, about the four competencies that can enhance our emotional intelligence. So starting from the top left quadrant, watch. The ability to watch, meaning you are aware of the, the impact that you have on others. How you come across to others and how you present yourself to others. And then you are able to interpret what you observe correctly and to think about what people are thinking, feeling and needing. 
right? So if you were to see somebody sitting alone, maybe with their hands, uh, with a broken arm, and that's where you need to interpret, okay, what is this person possibly needing as they come to church? Maybe you could pause to ask them what happened or pray for them, right? But it's actually a skill, right? That you have to slow down and, and, and do that. And then you have to manage, sometimes you have to manage yourself, sometimes you have to manage others, so you have to select a strategy, a course of action, and then of course you have to execute what you, your intent into action that is appropriate. So things like um, being aware of your words, the tone you use and your body language. So this is a simple framework that is about the competencies that we can develop to enhance our emotional intelligence. Now, we talked about church as a community of faith, but church is also a community of friends. I think that's also the vision that we have for church. And I share this quote. I think it's an important one to frame this part of the dialogue. Social contact does not necessarily buffer one against loneliness because the experience of loneliness seems to have more to do with an individual's perception of the quality of social interactions. So it's not just about making people very busy. You know, if you're lonely, come to church, get involved in five ministries and serve, you know, three times a week and so on and so forth. But it's actually about having quality in your, in your social interactions. And then we can't run away from the need to make friends. And of course, this is a topic that Dr. Tan is very passionate about. I asked him for his favorite quote on friendship and he shared this one. Friends are joined together in Christ. They not only teach each other what it means to love God, but also what it means to love like God. Dr. Tan, can you very quickly tell us the essence of spiritual friendship? In three seconds. No, what the... <laughs> I think every friendship is defined by two things, things we share in common and a common purpose. All friendships are defined by things we share in common. I share in common with my friend, I don't share with my, not my friend, and then we meet together for some purpose. So commonality and purpose are the two defining realities of every friendship. Né? C.S. Lewis and others will point this out. So in spiritual friendship, the commonality is our common friendship with Christ. So maybe... no. I don't know you, but I know Pastor Lawrence, you know Pastor Lawrence, and one day we meet, hey, you know Pastor Lawrence? So, yeah, man, good pastor, yeah, man, very good. Then, then we suddenly become friends because we have a common friend. So you know Jesus, no? yeah, man, Saviour and Lord, yeah, man, and so then we become friends. So our common friendship with Jesus is what binds us together. But then the common purpose is that as friends, huh, we help each other follow Jesus. We know that following Jesus alone is not what it was meant to be. We are meant to follow Jesus in the company of friends. So. This is where I think spiritual friendship is friends in Christ for following Christ. Friends in Christ for following Christ. But of course, like that, I, can be like, I can say like that with 1,000 people. So that's why I mentioned about the three levels. Uh, you cannot be in-depth friendship with many people. We don't have the bandwidth for that. Even Jesus wasn't. So Jesus had uh, ministered to the masses, but he ministered to the 12. Then he ministered to the three, Peter, James, and John. So with spiritual friendship of a certain depth, I think you have to be, you have to be very choosy. Like, who are these two or three that will help me to finish my race in Christ? Then I must have some healthy small groups as well. Then, of course, in general, I connect with everybody. Some of you are meeting for the first time. If I can encourage you, I will. And if you can encourage me, I will receive that from you. So that is people we meet along the way. Like, we should be friends with everybody in that sense. Like. But ongoing friendships, friends in Christ to help each other follow Christ, I think it will be the small group and the micro groups. Like. Uh, a small group and two or three very close friends. That's my understanding of spiritual friendship. I share here a quote that I found, which I think um, is, is a good way to think about what, what friendship is because it's progressive, right? The highest friendship demands growth. It must be progressive as life itself is progressive. Friends must walk together. They cannot stand still together. For that means death to friendship and to life. And mm. I think Pastor Lawrence and I have talked about how sometimes we end up forming cliques that stay stagnant and it's so hard for other people to join you. We are running out of time, but I think this point is important and I want to give Pastor Lawrence some time to talk about this issue of cliques. Yeah. Um, I mentioned that our church, we want to encourage people to form relationships. So one platform, to use the word that, that uh, Suin is uh, used, the platform is the cell group. So um, in, instead of assigning people to cell, and say you're assigned here. If you don't like it, just to ban. If you don't like it, you can leave church, <laughs> no? Uh, but uh, we always say, try this cell. If you don't like it, please let us know. We get to another cell. Second cell, you don't like it. Third cell, give us a lot of administrative headache, you know? Mm. But I say it's okay. Mm. The important thing is you. Mm. We want you to fit yeah, well, yeah. and not just because organizationally we want it to be neat. 
Number two, we allow people to change uh, after some time. Uh, and some, some churches are maybe they're too big, so they cannot afford this mess. Mm. A change to BBC, one go C D E F G. Then no, you are yeah. there, you stay put, obey. You know, I'm the leader, you obey me. But I was thinking that we are killing ourselves. The mm. the next thing is this person leaves because mm. it's, they are so miserable in a cell. If you insist it, but if you give freedom, then the whole idea is to help this person to stay to take root. And I think it has worked very well uh, in the church. People are forming group. But we have trouble that then people are so comfortable in their cell that they don't move at all. And um, uh, they, they form groups that others cannot penetrate. You know? So uh, how did the family come about? Well, Pastor Lawrence, you help them to form what? Now that they're formed, nobody can penetrate. So it is quite a dilemma to, to me. I, I mean, I can constantly challenge them that uh, on, on the one hand, you form friendship and friendship can last forever. You have to open your heart, you have to open yourself to lonely people because there are lots of lonely people. And it must come to a point in time where you're mature enough to know that your friendship uh, with that person, I mean, if, if Suli and myself were in the same cell, we had become very good friends. And we don't like Sue in to join because you dilute our friendship. I'm so you know, sorry. Keep you yeah. up, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but then I must say that, well, let this poor guy join because he's so lonely. And then, uh, never mind, our friendship is uh, it's not dependent on itself. It's now just incidental. Our lifelong friendship can now exist outside the cell so that I can make room for him. And Thank you are just trying to get people to come to uh, this stage. Nah. So you can be a victim of your own success. You have such a uh, successful church that people cannot get in. They, they, they feel very welcome, so warm, so nice, but they just cannot get into the yeah. family. Uh, and uh, I, I think that starting off church uh, would have no problem. Yeah. I, I know of... Uh, in Singapore, there is a, I won't tell you the name, there is a church just started, maybe one or two years, and I tell you, everybody's thinking about it, it's just growing and growing, and um, somebody from my church uh, got a boyfriend from that church, so I, I got the boyfriend to come to Living Sanctuary, I had a chat with him. They say we're trying both sides, you know, this church A and Living Sanctuary, and we've decided to go to church A. I say, why, what's wrong, teach me. You know, uh, uh, I mean, I won't hold you back, but I want to learn something from you before you leave. And uh, they say that, well, Living Sanctuary is very warm, very welcoming, but they do not integrate me. And I say, well, how about that church? How do they integrate you? Say, my, my church the girl who went over there, said that when I went there, they welcomed me. In the first week only, the people start contacting me already. Yeah. And I discovered something that... Uh, a starting church, everybody is looking for somebody. Yes, yes. So, for example, if we start a church today, none of us in the same church. Starting point is, I want to get you, you know, I want to know. And why can I meet you for lunch, etc. And so you feel so welcome in this church that we're starting first time, right? But if you come to an established church, everybody got their own family. And that is difficult. So, uh, we, we've got to keep uh, being very conscious of this and we must make deliberate effort to, to break clicks and challenge people, you can break click, but it does not mean that you break up a lifelong relationship. For me, I find it's very hard to break clicks. You tell cell group, I've got to split your cell group, they'll kill you. So I cannot, uh, they'll kill you. I want to split. So another approach I've tried is to give every cell group a missional culture from the day one. I cannot split you all, but can you all as one group uh, reach out to some other people now? Oh, so we are together. But together, we are reaching out to somebody else. So you are reaching out, but I'm not splitting the clip. Because it's very hard. Like, people love each other. They've been together through thick and thin, all that. Especially after six months, got new convert, we split you. So these are people have been building a relationship. It's very hard. So one is to remind them that their relationship transcends the group. That is one way. But I also tell them very early that you join our church, join our cell group. The cell group has an outward orientation, not just an inward orientation. We are there to care for each other, for sure. So, so that we can strengthen each other to reach those outside. Then at least they will be able to launch a group maybe. Maybe they will not split, but they may launch a group, maybe spare one or two more entrepreneurial ones to launch that group. But uh, no, they are still a group. They are not being split. So that's another way I try. 
because it's very hard to divide groups who have been together to take and thin for a long time, but I challenge them, don't look inward. You as a group, can you collectively pray what group, what people God want your CG to reach? And so that would be a healthy group. If it's always inward looking, not healthy. So you want to be healthy? Okay, I can't split you, but what vision for ministry does God give your CG? If it's all inward only, something is wrong. Okay, on that note, we are going to split you up with a mission to make some new friends. All right. Now, if you look at your name tag, it is color-coded. And that is the group that you're in, as well as this map shows you where to go. In each of your group, there will be a Capel staff who will be facilitating discussions with you. So we encourage you to open up and share uh, based on the questions that you'll be given. Okay, welcome back. If you're ready, you may start to uh, scan the QR code here and access the Padlet page where you can put in your thoughts. I hope you had a good time in your discussion groups. When I um, did my first facilitated dialogue uh, in March with Pastor Eugene Xiao and others, uh, after the event, I had a time of debrief with Pastor Eugene and he made a very interesting comment. He said that there are some conversations that will not happen unless it is a facilitated conversation. Yeah, I think the truth of that statement really um, stayed home with me because I think there are some topics that are maybe a little bit sensitive or a little bit awkward and we wouldn't want to talk about it unless there was facilitation, unless somebody helped us talk about it with one another. And I think this was partly why I wanted to put in time for facilitated small group discussions so that you could also experience that in a personal way. And especially for a topic of this nature, we didn't want you to sit and listen to us talk about loneliness without, con without interacting with people. So I want to come back to the panel now. And um, before we go into the closing, there was another question that I had um, given us to think about, which is to share with us some of the most significant friendships in your life. Because we started by talking about times when we felt lonely. But I think to end this dialogue, let's think about the power of friendships to, to really um, even change the course of our lives. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll give time to both gentlemen to share with us some significant friendships in your life. Uh, I, I told you that when I was young, I had great difficulty um, with this whole question of loneliness. And when I became a Christian uh, in my secondary one year, um, 13 year old, I joined a cell group and it was led by an adult by the name of Takai. Uh, and I related to him. He was like a father, like a cell leader, like a friend to me. And it's a very special kind of friendship. He doesn't look at me as a friend because I was a small boy, you know. He was just a cell leader. But in my heart, I worship him, you know, really worship him. And uh, because he, he led, he held the group. The group was where I got my friendship from. Uh, after one year of leading us, one, day, one night at a cell group, we said, okay, guys, uh, my girlfriend and I we, we decided to leave Singapore and to migrate to Hong Kong, pick up a post. Do you know that my world collapsed? Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Number one, I couldn't believe that it can happen. It mm. cannot happen. Mm. I mean, this thing doesn't happen in Christianity. A guy cannot just say, I go away. Mm. Uh, that was, on one hand, a very significant friendship. On the other hand, was such a disappointment that I just couldn't understand that uh, you can be abandoned. Of course, now that I'm leading a church, I found leaders stepping down and a whole group disintegrating. I tried to get them back, but they're all crushed. They say, we have been abandoned, we have been abandoned. And I realized what is the meaning of abandonment when a cell leader uh, comes up. So I think... Uh, Friendship that's broken can, can be quite devastating. That's one significant event that clicks. Uh, the other one was uh, in my late teens, early adulthood, God gave me a fantastic friend. And we spent hours and talking. And, uh, and then the friendship broke. It's a man, okay, man friend. 
uh, I was so, so broken and um, mm. that how could this great friend of mine um, begin to turn away? And f one day I discovered to my horrors that I, I wasn't treating him like a friend should treat him. Mm. I was horrified, you know. Mm. I thought he was an best friend, I was treating him as And the, the one thing is, um, that got back to me was that, Lawrence, you don't talk to him. You interrogate him. And I was devastated. Mm. I didn't even know. And there was a second experience that really stuck to me. I have killed a friend by the way I spoke to him. I didn't talk to him. Mm. I interrogated him. Maybe because my legal training or whatever. But I said, my God, uh, from now onward, uh, I will learn to be sensitive to the feelings of my, my friends. Mm. There's a second one. I have uh, two other friends that are very close to me to form three, three of us. Uh, and we, we were in church leadership. We were very, very good friends. And then one of them died very young. I mean, about 10 years ago, he, he died of a heart attack. And I was so devastated. It's, I felt that we are going to last forever and that the first to go would be me. I'm the oldest uh, of the three. Mm. Mm. Uh, and the loss of a friend through death uh, was very, very painful. Now I'm left with just one. And two years ago, he had a severe heart infection. He almost died, you know. I went to the ICU, I scolded him. I said that you cannot die, you know. You, you know. <laughs> I, was, I was so angry. There was this righteous anger in me that I felt that I've come to say that maybe I would even lose a, I would really, really be no friend, you know. Uh, but he survived, and today he's operating at 25% capacity, uh, still, still a friend. But these are experiences of friendship that really sticks uh, with me. La. And the, the fragility, you know, the pain that you go through, uh, your mistake, you know, you're losing them, uh, well, I suppose makes me for who I am. Mm. No, to ask the Lord whether I should have lunch with him more often or not. <laughs> You're so, so silent. <laughs> but maybe what you've just shared is a reminder that no earthly friend can replace the friendship of Jesus. Uh, earthly friends, sooner or later, uh, they will leave. And some of us have lost people that we love dearly. My, one of my best friends two years ago came out from the same village in Penang and, and he passed away. You know. We reach the stage of life where we say goodbye more often. Now. So only Jesus. And I think the best friendships on earth point us towards the friendship of Jesus. And Jesus will be with us in this life, the life to come, Jesus. Uh, before I go on, I must, my wife reminded me when you share words like three to one, people don't know what you're talking about. So this is actually a book that I've written. $12. That's uh, a... <laughs> Three, three to one means, uh, when I talk about spiritual friendship, people say there's a good idea but got no time. So I said, how about three friends meeting two hours once a month, can or not? Over a makan. Then they think, think three friends, two hours once a month over makan, can lah. So it's been around for some time and it's helped some people find uh, friendship so there's some copies. It just lay really out the theology and the practice of, of the close friendships. In terms of close friends, like I said, I, I lost one a few years ago. Uh, same age, we went through school together. It's very unreal uh, when you just, people who are so dear to us uh, have passed on. And if they're in the Lord, then I say one day we meet again. Uh. But friendship, I think of two. One is a friendship group I started when I was in Singapore. When I, I've always believed in micro groups, two, three, three to four people meeting together. For one thing, it's easier to find a time to meet, a big group, or find common time to meet in Singapore. Then uh, I had some in Malaysia, where when I came down to Singapore, I prayed that God would give me one here as well, because I know how critical it is for my own life that I walk with friends, critical. So we pray, pray for about a year, I didn't have then. So I, was, I felt convicted to approach, for some reason, uh, Kok Hyang, <laughs> leader of crew then, and then Doug Edmund, leader of NEF. So they also were at a stage of their own journey that they felt the need for spiritual friendship. This one is a God thing, not, not I do one. Lah. So we met for a meal and said, what do you guys think? We, we, we meet once a month just to help each other on our journey. 
and they felt convicted in their heart. Friendship cannot force one. You commit yourself to each other because you want to covenant with each other. So we met for many years until Doug had to go back to the States. But uh, that was a very powerful group. And I'm saying this because it's not always about chemistry. Uh, we didn't have any pre-existing chemistry. We, were not, we didn't know each other very much before. So I think I understand the power of chemistry, but sometimes I think you can build chemistry by being empathetic, by being encourager. We build a connection. Uh. I mean, I know you very well, but one, every time we meet, I, I listen to you, I, I, I empathize, I encourage, and I receive your ministry to me. Right? Sometimes we are happy to meet other people, need, we are too proud to receive people's ministry. So friendship to me is mutual to some degree. And so we built this group. There was no pre-existing chemistry, but we built a chemistry because of our love for each other. I think it was bon Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said, we are united in Christ, not, not in chemistry. Yeah. We are united in... <laughs> In Christ. Although I don't think Hoffer would use the word chemistry. Anyway, the other one is a friend of mine who is now retired, but he was a director of a bank uh, in, in, in KL when I was a pastor then. And I first met him on the phone because I had to call his church to discuss some matter, some business matter. And uh, he was the chairman or, or one of the leaders. So we talked on the phone. We never met each other, but as we began to talk, uh, so we don't know each other, we began to talk. Somehow you, have, you feel a sense of connectedness. So this one is chemistry one. A bit stranger, but you thought you kind of you feel a sense of connectedness, leh. And then uh, we began to meet, and 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 we we really the Lord like David Jonathan type, lah. We cleave our heart together. Uh, he has supported me financially, time wise, in so many ways. I think my support for him is so much less. But I think friends don't kira, like, they don't keep count uh, who help who more. But the friends are just happy to help. So we have worked together for many years. I owe him big time, and that is a friend. Which, so in, in some sense, some of these friends are gifts from God. You cannot go and manufacture one. No? God give you, and you say thank you, God, that you give me such a friend. So it's this brother who's still around, and uh, so there's two friendships. Lah. One is the group of three that we had to build that friendship. One is a gift from God that I, I receive uh, that we just talk on the phone only connect really and connected all these years. I remember in our first dialogue um, back back in March, we talked about intergenerational issues and relationships and. I think for, for the older people in our midst, it's a very vulnerable time because they are losing friends. And you know they, they see their good friends pass away. And it's a very difficult season of life. And I think we, we could all, those of us who are younger, can be more empathetic to, to that. And I, I, I think that the answer is really intergenerational relationships. Speaking as somebody who's slightly younger, um, even, and, uh, and I've told Pastor Lawrence this, that in trying to find a cell, I, I attend Pastor Lawrence's church and I'm quite new there. And in trying to find a cell, I have not been able to find a cell that I was truly desiring. And I realized that I was desiring an intergenerational cell with young people, with the elderly, with married people, with singles, you know, just bring it on. I, I want community. I want to be with people different from me. But I found homogeneous cells that tended to be of a certain kind of people. And like Pastor Lawrence said, sometimes these cells are harder to penetrate because they are a certain way and I'm not that certain way. And so in the course of doing this work, I have felt like maybe if I cannot find what I'm looking for, I should go start <laughs> what I need. <laughs> so really doing this piece of work has in some ways has shifted me to think about maybe starting an intergenerational cell for people who have that same desire to connect and to make friends across the generations. So it's something that I'm seriously considering, and Pastor Lawrence knows this because we've talked about it. And so even as you are sitting here listening to this, I hope that somehow you can also be the answer to this issue that we've talked about. Not that loneliness is a problem to be solved, but I think we recognize that we have what it takes to meet some needs uh, in our midst. Yeah, so on that note, what are your final words for the audience as they continue to grapple with this issue and go back to different churches, some of whom may be in leadership positions, what would be your final message to them? This one I say first so that let the seafood have the last word. <laughs> our culture you Actually, must respect. Actually, I will have the last word. But... Oh, sorry. In our, in, our, in our culture, you must respect elders. I think I like what one of the persons said. Like we, you don't wait for some major organizational change. You, la, you can you find two or three friends to walk together with and encourage, and maybe that will spread. Things usually are caught and not taught. La, no? I mean, it's useful to have seminars and all that. 
but let people taste the joy of someone who loves you and accepts you for who you are. I'll tell you, once you taste that, I'll you. And then, um, of course, there'll be conflict or that. That's a given for relationships. There'll be conflict. But if you love each other, then we work through those conflicts and we would walk together. And so the Bible says, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. Will there be two or three places where people actually, actually know you? And always we put up our nice front one. Uh, people know you and love you. And then we help each other become more like Jesus. So I said, yes, we need organizational change. But usually things start from the ground up. Uh, you... This weekend, you go and find two or three friends, ask the Lord to show you some people from your, from your list. Or hey, you haven't talked for a long time, you haven't makan or not? Then I said, hey, nice day, hey, how about uh, we do this once in a while, once a month, or we makan and encourage one another. You'd you be, be surprised what may happen. Some may be, someone may be waiting for your call. Somebody got to start somewhere. That one you got to be big, thick skin and start. Lah. Some may say, I don't need you, I swallow. Okay. But, <laughs> but then some may say, well, I've been really lonely and I really needed someone to talk to. I don't know who to talk to. You get that as well. So let's, let's start from the ground up. And then we see what happens. La. We need organizational change, but let it start with you. you know? it sounds like some kind of slogan. So let it start with you. Okay. I, I think that I think all of us do need friends, and uh, we must recognize that. Uh, therefore, if you have no friends, you have to go look for friends and not wait. If you have friends, treasure them. And after treasuring your friends, can both of you have the heart to look out for lonely people, especially in the church? It is just not acceptable that in the church family, you find lonely people. And that there you are every Sunday so happily with a buddy-buddy, you know, and then you, you find people standing at some corner, totally unattended, unkept for. I, I pray that all of us will have this sensitivity, this feeling for people. And maybe, if possible, God would allow us to experience seasons of loneliness. And when we've gone through that, and then we will be more sensitive. We will be, they, they have a greater tenderness of feeling uh, for this type of people. And then we make church. I mean, a real church. Mm. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you so much. Now, my, I want to end with a story, but like with many stories that you find on the internet, sometimes you cannot verify the source, right? So take it as a story, take it as a parable. But this is something that I read many years ago, and in the course of preparing for this dialogue, it came back to me. And I just want to share it, because I think there is some measure of truth that we can all take away and apply in our context. So. Some, a student had asked the anthropologist Margaret Mead this question, what is the earliest sign of true civilization? So in the course of you know, doing archaeology and study about, studying about ancient civilization, at which point do you know that civilization has, human, humanity has moved on to civilization? So this question was supposedly asked to her. And you would expect her to talk about maybe um, tools, right, or relics, or religious artifacts, uh, things along those lines. Her answer apparently was when they discovered a huge femur dating from 15,000 years ago. Now again, I cannot verify whether this is a historical account and how accurate this is, but let's, let's treat it as a story for now. Now the femur is the longest bone in the body, linking the hip to the knee. In other words, in layman terms, it's your thigh bone. Nah. So if you imagine, if your thigh bone breaks, um, in the past, it would have taken a long time to heal without the help of modern medicine. And of course, if your thigh bone breaks, it means you are immobile. You can't hunt, you can't gather your berries, you can't farm, you can't get water. So based on the law of the survival of the fittest, you would, you would perish. Mm. Anybody with a broken bone, that, that significant would, would perish. And so the, the story goes is that when they found the, a healed femur, it meant that somebody stopped to care for the person with the broken bone. Mm. Somebody kept this person alive. And so that is a sign, an early sign of civilization. Now, again, like I said, I cannot vouch for the authenticity of everything in this story, whether it's attributed to the right person, but nonetheless, this story is, is quite inspiring because the whole idea of caring for somebody who's weak and vulnerable is really intrinsic to what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. And of course, 
This is what the gospel commands of us, that we love one another and to care for somebody who perhaps cannot give back, but somehow you are able to reach out and to nurse them back to health. And I think even in my small group, there was a good point made by somebody that somebody who's lonely may not appear to be lonely. Yes, yes. It may be very different from what you imagine. Somebody who is confident and young and um, even wealthy, perhaps you don't normally associate them to be lonely, might be feeling really lonely. And it really takes a lot of discernment. It will take your superpower to actually discern that and to reach out to them. And I think um, on this note, yeah, I end this part of the program uh, okay. wishing that... Yes, please. Forgive me. <laughs> It just dawned on me that this is ease and crew, and we haven't said anything about evangelism. And I'm saying that evangelism in a lonely world, a lot of it would depend on building authentic friendships with non-believers. And when we have friendships within the church, we are doing friendship training, so we can now extend friendship also to non-believers. And when they see an authentic friend, they will want to know your friend Jesus. So because this is crew and ease, so we have to... So I'm saying there is a connection. It's not just in-house when you love each other within the church, which is critical in itself, but I think it is also training to reach those outside the church. So this has implications both in and our ministry, our evangelistic ministry. I just want to... Sorry, I just... No, I just definitely. No. I need to say that. Thank you for making that point that really the, the end goal is that we, we learn to love one another, especially those who need it most outside the church. And we start by working on ourselves within the church so that we're all healed up and strong and yeah, that we can really be obedient to the Great Commission, as, as you have pointed out, that that really is the end goal. Yeah, to glorify God through our relationships. All men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Yeah, so I really thank the panel at this point. Uh, would you join me in uh, appreciating them? Yeah. You may take a seat to that. Yeah. I think all of you enjoyed tremendously with you. Would you offer them a great thank you? Well, I came to this uh, seminar. I didn't know that I'm going to save money. I saved twelve dollars, three to one. So no need to buy them. Huh? <laughs> That's something I learned. It was very simple, and we can actually use that to to start uh, building groups. They say how. How, how can I find a friend? Be a friend. Be a friend. And so, how do I stop my own loneliness? Look for someone who is lonely. Touch his life. And the reward is just amazing. So, so thank you so much. Uh, you, you two have been uh, sharing deeply. I cannot tell who is older, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe one is pretending to be younger. Yeah. But, <laughs> Thank you for adding humor to the session. That's, that's, that's wonderful. This school, East Asia School of Theology, you're never too old to join us. Our aim is a holistic, holistic approach to evangelism, touching the heart first. We do not believe in information per se. We believe in transformation. And so that uh, our hearts are not right, all the information will go the wrong way. And so, but that's not only the heart, the head, but the hands also. We want to produce people who are ministry practitioners, not just learned guys whose heads are so big and so proud they are useful nothing for nothing. So our aim is still the Great Commission. If the school is not for Great Commission, we should close it. All right? And so you can join us, and you can you say not sure what, whether this school is good or not. Join us for visiting, uh, as a visiting student, and about uh, 100% uh, percent, uh, cheaper and all that. Come and if you really can't afford, we'll give you free. If it's good, you pay our full price. <laughs> no, seriously, we want our hearts is just to bless you, to make sure that you can be able to be strong, mature, fulfilled, and be useful in the Lord's kingdom work. I think Jonathan, can you see Jonathan there? Would you wave? He's got his card on the table beside uh, Sue Lee's, right? Uh, he's, huh? Uh, I'm. I'm um, making more announcements because I do not want you to feel lonely. <laughs> okay. All right, so we need you to come so that we will not be lonely. <laughs>
Again, thank you so much, Kapel, for, for being a blessing to us. Their hearts to bless you. So please look up uh, the notes that they gave you. And uh, she said that we are going to write, uh, write a, a note. Huh? Uh, she didn't say give you a gift, but just a note to, to tell you all the stories. That would be worth more than the gift. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you have brought us together. A divine appointment. That our hearts are refreshed. Our minds are filled with ways that we can be able to deal with loneliness in ourselves and especially help others who are lonely. Lord, we belong to a church, all of us here, who know you personally as Lord and Savior. And we know that you call us to love so that we will prove ourselves to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And Father, you have called us also to one call, to great commission, so that we can be able to spread the good news that others who do not know you can solve this problem permanently so that they do not have loneliness, but they have you as Christ, as our Lord, as our Savior, as our Shepherd, as our friend. Thank you for reminding us to our brother at the time and for the many ways that we have learned from them. Great ways. Help us to remember. But not only to remember, but to practice. So part us your blessing for We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. So this is once again the QR code for the Padlet page. If you need if you need that, you can access that anytime. If you scroll to the end of the page, you see this column titled Church Equipped News and Resources. And on that, in that space, I have put in the link to the Charities Capability Fund. This is a fund by NCSS for registered charities. And there are grants available for training and consultancy. Right? So these are opportunities for your churches that are registered charities to have access to funding for different training and consultancy needs. Not many churches know about this. Uh, that's why we want to make this news available. So if you go to our Padlet page, the link is there. It's worth checking out. Uh, perhaps you could let your admin or your HR team look into this because there is funding available to upskill church staff, to train and to do different things. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. All right, so this is the link to the NCSS webpage and you can also shoot an email to inquiries at ncss.gov.sg. So all that information is on the Padlet page, but I just wanted to point this section up to you. If you are interested to read up more about the issue of loneliness in the church, um, there is a special discount when you buy these resources from the website, from the media ministry or crew. Right? So that's the QR code for the online store. There is also a special promotion because East is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. So each regular course will only now cost $30 taken for audit in this academic year, which is from July 2022 to June 2023. So you have huge savings of up to 88% off per course, right? So if you're interested in some self-learning, you can check out what EASE is offering. And there is a special promotion because of the anniversary celebrations. Yeah. And finally, Again, we are so grateful to East for making it possible for us to be here. We literally took over all of their space during the breakout rooms. So we thank you for the generosity and there's really been a lot of um, back-end work preparing your name tag, setting up, preparing the tag team. Um, they are doing a recording of the event as well. So East is a very, very important partner in making this happen. So if you want to say thank you and give them a love gift, please do so. You can always indicate uh, where you want the money to go to, whether it is for student aid or most needed. So we are really grateful to East for making this event possible.